audience, uh, especially our, those listening in online, and our numbers have been very high. We're so appreciative of that, that God is leading in taking this message about a man called Jesus out there. Um, if you would like, again, to share this with a family member or friend, there's a way you can go back after the meetings are over, after Saturday, they'll be archived and you'll be able to find them on YouTube. And here's how you get that. Uh, the first step is go to your internet browser and type in YouTube. I'll give you time to write stuff down out there. And in the YouTube search engine, type Valley View Seventh Day Adventist Church. Again, that is Valley View Seventh Day Adventist Church on your browser. Scroll until you see our channel with the same title and a picture of the church. Click on that channel. On the channel page, you will see the word playlist. Click on playlist. Click on the playlist titled, A Man Called Jesus. It's the seminar series, A Man Called Jesus. Go to the video that you would like to watch and click on it. And for those of you here, is there anyone by show of hands that would need a copy of these instructions? Okay, would you come up here and get this for me, please? Anyone else? I'll have it. Okay, could you pass these out to anyone who needs a copy? And if there's not enough copies here, please make a copy. Have someone make a copy and pass that around to each person. Okay, thank you very much. So again, we'll be reading this again. For those of you listening, we'll be reading this again on Friday night and also on our Saturday closing meeting. If you didn't get everything there, we'll be reading it again for you. Okay, and if someone, uh, say, uh, Judy, if, you, if somebody else needs a copy, will you make a copy for them tonight? Thank you. Okay, our scripture reading tonight is found in Luke chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Luke the Gospel of Luke. A physician, Luke was a physician, chapter 17, verse 5 and 6. And the apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Pray that our faith would be like a mustard seed as we invite our dear Pastor Abner to come forward and share with us what has been put on his heart tonight to share with this group and also those at home that are listening. I'm so grateful and so thankful that each and every one of you have made an effort to come out tonight. I'm even more grateful and thankful that you at home, even though you couldn't be here with us, you joined us through communications. That's important. See, because one of the things that Jesus did is that he found ways of contacting, communicating with people. No, they didn't have internet back then. Facebook wasn't even a thought. Or even cell phones. YouTube? This was YouTube right here. You know? Face to face. But you know, I'm excited because Jesus, in spite of having so many challenges to reach people, He did something to reach each and every one of us. And tonight, that's why we're here. Because we want to reach and touch the hand of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I was sitting there. And now I'm standing here. The few steps that I took, my request has not changed. My request is that you fill me tonight with the power of your Holy Spirit. That whatever words come out of my mouth. 
Father, may they honor you. That you filled me with the right message from your throne of mercy to share with your people here tonight. Speak through me. And may your Holy Spirit move in our hearts. As we open your word, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us application. For we want to see the face of God. This is our prayer. And I ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last night, I talked about something very important. And I don't even know if you picked up on it or not. But last night's message talked about how the Savior went to different places and he was teaching. But there was one place in particular that he loved to go to. It was the marketplace. You know what the marketplace was? That's for us today, right? It was Galilee. See, Galilee was a port. There was a lot of trading going on there. And in the area of Galilee, that's when the fishermen would come in. And they would unload their fresh catches. And they would sell it right there immediately. Capitalizing. Who doesn't like fresh food? Ah. Uh, you don't like fresh food? Oh, see. <laughs> I know. See, he, here's my question. Who does not like fresh food? You get it now? We all want fresh food. So tonight, God has filled us with the freshness of His Holy Word. I love this. See, because we talked, we were in the book of Luke last night. Tonight, we're traveling down another book, the book of Mark. Luke, as was said, was a physician. Mark, Mark was one of the twelve. And when you go back and you read the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... All four of them say roughly the same thing. The only difference is that each and every one of them had a different um, perception of how they viewed the message that Jesus was sharing to the people of Galilee and to all of the areas of Judea, Jerusalem, where he traveled. See, Jesus was never stuck in one place. Jesus made it a point to go from one place to the next. I don't know about you today, but I, I pray in the name of Jesus that the Lord encourages you to continue to move. See, because a Christian doesn't sit. A real Christian is always on the move. Because being a Christian, according to the definitions of several different dictionaries and Bible dictionaries, is someone who imitates Christ. Are you imitating Christ tonight? That's a good question, right? One that might be a little tough to answer right now. And that's okay, I understand. This is a personal question. I'm not expecting someone to say, Oh, yeah, me, I am, I am. Because the fact of the matter is, is, no matter how much we try to imitate Jesus, at some point or another, we fall on our face. That's what sin does. That's why we struggle. That's, that's why sometimes, you know, you come to church and, 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 and you're so hurt. You're so full of pain. All you can do is sit there and say, Lord, what am I doing wrong? When it's not even you. The only thing that you're culpable of or guilty of is allowing Satan to tempt you. I had a conversation today. And I was telling someone that in, in my days when I was living away from God, I didn't know what it was like to function without a drink. And I was an alcoholic. And it, it really, really hurt me. It really hurt me. 
It hurt me spiritually. It hurt me physically. It hurt me professionally. It hurt me emotionally. It completely disconnected me, not just from God, but it disconnected me from my family. I still suffer those consequences today. I'm trying to mend those bridges, but I've come to the understanding there is nothing I can do to mend those bridges. The only one that can mend those bridges is the one that I finally surrendered my heart and my life to, and that's Jesus Christ. I want to start off this, this evening with a question, okay? Whether you be transparent about it or not, it's up to you. How many of you have storms in your lives? That's practically all of us, right? And I'm not here to quantify if your storm is greater than mine or mine is greater than yours. The fact of the matter is that we're all facing storms. And you can look at the storm in your life and you can say, Boy, I tell you, nobody, nobody in this church faces a storm like me. I've got it worse. And you might be right. I don't know. But you also have it wrong. Why do you have it wrong? Because nobody in the history of humanity, no one has ever faced a storm like Jesus. Do you know what it's like to be innocent and be put to death? Granted, I know, I understand that there have been innocent people that have gone to death row. How many of them have resurrected to life? Do you understand the question? Do you understand the concept? This goes deeper than what you and I can understand. And tonight we're in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 35 to 41. And I want you to go there because Jesus, throughout the entire book of Mark chapter 4, was talking about parables. Luke chapters 13 to 15 talk nothing about but just parables. Okay? Okay? The book of Luke is filled with so many lessons. And as he was a physician, he was a doctor, he knew how he needed to teach people to live a better life. So he focused on parables. Pastor, if that's the case, how come you didn't go to him tonight? Well, because there's something very interesting about Mark chapter 4 that I want us to take a look at tonight. The first parable that we see here talks about the parable of the sower. My, my wife and I, we were trying to do a project. We were trying to plant some, some vegetables. And here I am scratching my head, plowing by hand. It was a lot of hard work. But God helped us do it. And, and, and I saw that tomato getting bigger. And I was rejoicing. But then, true story by the way. But then, the temperature started dropping. And, and no longer is the, are, are those tomato plants robust and growing because now the cold killed it. Well, I got one green tomato. It's probably about maybe that big. I don't know what to do with it. So... My wife, being the cheerful person that she is, I love her attitude. I love her spirit. She doesn't look at the glass half empty. She always looks at the glass half full. She's taught me that. And I love her for that. I really appreciate and thank God for the partner that he's given me in life. Sometimes we need that. So Jesus was talking about the parable of the sower. Where and how should someone plant seeds? But he wasn't just talking about the physical seeds. He was talking about the spiritual seeds. Because there's two types of seeds. There's the physical one, and then there's the spiritual one. Then later on, as he's still talking to the people in Galilee... He starts talking to the, 
to the disciples about what was the purpose for even having parables. Because the purpose for having parables is for us to better understand the lessons that Jesus had been talking about. See, because he said it so eloquently. You look at things and you don't know what you're looking at. You hear things and you don't comprehend. So I have to break it down to you in a way that makes it more elementary. I love it because Jesus didn't say that we were dumb. He just says, I have to explain it to you in a way that you can apply it to your life. But we don't learn. <laughs> we still ask questions. Like, why, Lord, why am I in this crucible? Why, why is this happening to me? And the reason why this is happening to you is because God needs for you to surrender. That's a strong word. So as Jesus goes on and he continues to explain what parables are all about, then he says, you are a light. You are a light. Because now that you've received this message of what it means to understand a parable, to understand the teaching, now you've got to be a light and you've got to share that light with the world. Although I fear that actually we like to hide that light. Because we don't understand, we don't get it, we don't know if we've got the right kind of light or if Jesus can even speak through us. That's called lack of faith, my friends. Then he talks to them about how the seed must grow. Then to top it all off, he says, look, you don't need a big seed. You don't need a big message. If your life, if your faith was just as tiny, a millimeter, a tiny seed, a mustard seed, you can grow to be great big things. The problem that we have is that we're not sure if we are capable of being as big as Jesus. But we are infatuated with the life of Jesus. I can ask this question and I'm pretty sure most of us, if not all of us, are going to raise our hand. But I'm going to ask it anyways. How many of us here tonight want to be like Jesus? Amen. Amen. Because I want to be like him too. Unfortunately, I still lack. And so here's every story, and we're coming to our message tonight. Every story, every parable, every practical aptitude lesson that Jesus gave, now somehow needs to be put, needs to be put into, or placed into practice. And, and, and when you look at verses 35, starting in verse 35, you begin to see how Jesus now gives his disciples a practical lesson in faith and in obedience. If you're going through a storm today, it's because Jesus wants to give you a practical lesson on faith and obedience. No, you didn't hear that. I'm going to say it again. Because in my heart, as I'm saying that, I'm saying, thank you, Lord. Amen. If you're going through a storm right now, tonight, it's because Jesus wants to give you a practical lesson. He wants to show you more about how to have faith and how to have obedience. Because Jesus wants to save you. How many of us believe here tonight that Jesus is coming again soon? See, we believe he's coming again. We have a challenge understanding the soon part. Because I had this conversation today with someone and they said, Well, Pastor, how soon do you think he's going to be coming? That's not in my wheelhouse to say. But it is my prerogative. It is my business to be ready when Jesus returns. Amen? You need to be ready for when Jesus returns because Jesus is coming back soon. 
I want us to go to, math, to Mark, excuse me, chapter 4, starting from verse 35. And I want us to read exactly what the Bible says. Now, you have different versions. I've said it all week, and I'll say it again. I'm reading out of the Good News Translation. It is a commentary version, and it breaks things down in a way that makes it applicable to your life. Because I don't care if you come in here. My worry is that you come out of here different than how you came in. That's what Jesus' goal is for you and me tonight. And so the Bible says in Mark chapter 4 verse 35 saying, On that evening, the same day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go across to the other side of the lake of Galilee. Verse 36, so they left the crowd, the, disi the disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting in, and they took him to the other side. They went with him. They could not and would not leave the master by himself. I'm sorry to say this, but I have to. There are a number of us that come to church, but we have abandoned the master. We've left him behind. And I'm going to share with you this evening why the master has been left behind. Pastor, is that something of our making? Yes. It is. It is my fault. Because I have the choice to walk with him, to talk with him, or to back off of him. So yes, it is my choice. It is my problem. It is my responsibility. Reading verse 36, it says, So they left the crowd, the disciples, the disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting, and they took, them, took him with them. Other boats were there too. They were not alone. See, Jesus was still talking. Jesus was still preaching. Jesus was still teaching from the boat. He had to give himself some room because if not, people would have suffocated him. This is how powerful of a speaker Jesus was. And I want to tell you tonight that that power has not disappeared. That power to speak to us has multiplied. The problem is that we have gone tone deaf. We're deaf now. Sin has overtaken our mind and our heart, and we have become deaf to the calling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 37 says, Suddenly a strong wind blew up, and the waves began to spill over into the boats so that they were getting filled with water. How many times in this life have you been smooth sailing? Everything is good with your job. Everything is good with your spouse. Everything is good with your family. And all of a sudden, a storm kicks up. And then you feel like you are drowning. Because you are drowning spiritually. Maybe not physically, but I want you to understand. I desire that you understand tonight. That what affects you emotionally will also affect you spiritually. Did you get that? What affects you emotionally also affects you spiritually. And all of a sudden, things begin to happen and you begin to ask yourself, what in the world is going on? Is Jesus not with me? Why do I feel like I am suffocating? Because you took it upon yourself to suffocate and drown in your own stubbornness. You thought you could do it without Jesus. And now Jesus is saying, 
apart from me, you can do nothing. How many of us need Jesus tonight? Amen. Amen. It's not just tonight, like you said, every day. But every day, I have to fall on my knees and I have to turn to Him in prayer. Because if I don't, I'm basically telling Him, Hey Lord, thanks for this day that you've given me, but I got this. We don't realize that. It's a problem. It's, it's, it's a travesty. Having to get up every morning, you know, stretching. Uh, uh, uh. Ah, oh, that alarm, let me turn it off. And go on your daily route just like nothing ever happened. Because you're on autopilot. The second you wake up, you're already on autopilot. And then all of a sudden, your autopilot is not working. And because it's not working, now you're heading into a crash, an accident. And you're trying to maneuver your way through life. And all of a sudden, these storms begin to rise. Look at what the Bible says. Suddenly a strong wind, verse 37. Suddenly a strong wind blew up and the waves began to spill over. Look at 38. Because here's the truth about what really happens when you accept Jesus in your life. Verse 38 says, Jesus was in the back of the boat. I'm going to pause there. I said a little while ago that the reason why we have storms in our lives, the reason why we have problems in our lives, is because we have decided that we want to get ahead of the Master. We think we can do it without Him. And Jesus was there in the back of the boat, okay, and what does your Bible say that he was doing? I have a problem with that. There's a group, a Seventh-day Adventist group, or at least they used to be, called Take Six. They have a song that says, He does not sleep, he does not slumber. And I don't believe with all my heart that when they looked at Jesus and they saw him with his eyes closed, they were under the assumption, just like us today, that he's asleep. Come on. Jesus never sleeps. He's always on the go and his eyes are always watching over us. Always. <laughs> Sometimes I may look like I'm asleep. Right, Henry? And all of a sudden, really what I'm doing is kind of sort of meditating. You know, I was here, and I had my eyes closed, and I don't know if this ran through the head of Brother Philip or not, but he said, oh, I hope the pastor's not falling asleep. We were just talking about seven to eight hours rest, weren't we not? That was a health nugget. But I was meditating. I was praying. Because it does you no good if I don't connect with the Lord first. And I ask Him to speak through me. I can give you a great speech. You don't need a great speech. You need Jesus. Amen. I need Jesus. And so Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on a pillow. I still believe that this was the perspective of the disciples, because they were still trying to maneuver the waves themselves. And look what it says here. Then the disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, 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 don't you care? Look, we're dying here. We're going to perish. I don't see anywhere here where the Bible says, then Jesus stretched his arm. He said, are you guys okay? Oh, sorry about that. I nodded off. Does the story say that? 
I love what verse 39 says. Because verse 39 says, Then Jesus stood up. Did you get that? He was asleep, according to them. And then Jesus stood up. I've never seen anybody who's been sleeping stand up so quickly. We take our time, don't we? Jesus does not take his time. Amen? When Jesus sees that you're in trouble, he immediately comes to his feet. And he comes to your rescue even before you decide to fall on your knees and pray. Jesus is already there right beside you saying, I'm listening. What can I do to help you? Are you ready to listen to me now? Or are you still willing to do your own thing? Because that's what separated us from him in the first place. The fact that we wanted to do our own thing instead of doing what he wants us to do. I said last night, and I'm going to say it again. Satan is the great deceiver. He tempts you. But just because he tempts you, it doesn't mean that you have to fall for it. You want to know why we fall for it? Mm -mm. Because we want to. We want to. I had a conversation today with a, a colleague from a different conference. And he was telling me, hey, do you remember that time that we went to this pastor's training and they brought in a couple and, and, and the guy had had some extracurricular activities outside of the marriage and uh, he was given an option, he was given a choice. I believe in choices, by the way. I said, yeah, I, I remember that couple. Yeah, young couple. I said, yes, they were. They were pro what, probably in their... Mm, Late 20s, early 30s? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one, that's the one. I talked to a friend of his who ran into me, and he said, <laughs> he left ministry and he left his wife. He's on his second wife now. And those are the people that we're calling to be our examples. Why am I sharing this with you? I share this with you because your experience with Jesus can do one of two things. It will either A, encourage someone, listen carefully, either it will encourage someone or bring the entire house down. Jesus was sitting there, then he stood up, and according to the word of God, this is what he said. Look, verse 39 says it very plain. Jesus stood up and he commanded the winds. He said, Be quiet. Be quiet. The King James Version says that he said, Peace. Be still. Your storm tonight. Are you still trying to face it yourself? Or are you calling out to Jesus? And can you hear Jesus say, Shh, my child. Shh. Peace. Be still. problem that we have is that many times we want to call out to Jesus because we left him behind us and then we want to ask him to help us but we want to do the work for him if that's you tonight I'm going to be the bearer of bad news and I'm going to tell you there is no way you can make it. 
the Bible says, be still and know that I am your God. Stop trying to fight against Jesus. If you're calling out for him to do something, let him do what he has to do in your life. You need to learn to surrender because only by surrendering will you behold, will you be able to see the power of God in your life. You've tried. Where has it gotten you? When I tried to do things on my own, it only led me deeper in sin. And it wasn't until I finally gave up that Jesus said, Shh, my son, be still. And when I was finally still, I heard the voice of God. That's why I am here today. Because He, He calmed my storm. I know that this is tough. Look at what verse 40 says. Because I know that this scares you, by the way. Verse 40 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you guys afraid? Do you still have no faith? Your version, I'm sure, says, O ye of little faith, and the following verse, verse 41, tells you how stunned these men were. Because verse 41 says, but they were terribly afraid and they began to speak to one another and they began to ask each other, who, who is this man? Who is this man that even the winds and the waves Obey him. I got Brother Wayne tonight singing for the altar call. 